Welcome, Professor Esther Hoffmann. She's glaucoma specialist, head of department of glaucoma at the university in Mainz. And the talk will be about update on the Gutenberg health study. Esther, can you hear me? Thank you, Stefan, for this kind invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this um, two great um, days of meeting. Congratulations to that. So yes, a short update on the Gutenberg Health Study. So what are we doing there? We are using the OCT Spectralis in the Gutenberg Health Study since uh, 2012. And I will share with you some um, studies we have um, already performed on retinal nerve fiber layer imaging, on some choroidal measurements, and also on the imaging of the vitreomacular interface. So to remind you, some of uh, some of you might know, the Gutenberg Health Study is a large uh, population-based prospective study um, with more than 15,000 participants in the um, um, Rhein-Main region around Mainz and Mainz-Bingen. We started in 2007 with the recruition of um, the, the participants and um, included patients uh, between 35 and 74 years old. Um, we are at the moment in the um, follow-up two, uh, so from two, uh, 2017 to 22, so we have um, already um, lots of years of follow-up already. Unfortunately, not with all instruments and all imaging and visual field devices, but um, still a large number of information and data. So um, the Gutenberg Health Study has an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the, the general health, so um, mainly cardiovascular health and vascular health in general are investigated and also eye diseases and mental diseases. And um, it is interdisciplinary um, cooperation with um, laboratory medicine, so all patients um, receive blood um, drawal, and also with the um, biostatistics um, in, and informatics institute here in Mainz. Um, we are lucky that we have a large part of ophthalmologic examination of 25 minutes within the five hours of complete examination of each participants. And each patient um, undergoes objective refraction, tonometry, keratometry, and visual field screening with the FCT uh, perimeter, fundus photography, biometry, and the spectralis OCT. And um, we also added the OCT angiography at the 10-year um, follow-up. Um, so what um, scans do we perform? We, um, due to the restrictive um, restriction of time, we had um, decided for a modified posterior pole scan together with um, Heidelberg Engineering. So as you can see here, we are using the ID EDI mode, uh, 15 times 15 degrees, 25 art frames and 37 sections through the um, macula. The next scan for each patient is the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer scan, also um, um, performed with the EDI mode, 40 art frames, 7068 scans, A scans, and an optic nerve head volume scan. So these three scans are performed with the normal OCT and the OCT, NG OCT. Uh, we have added uh, recently, uh, we are performing the macula and the optic nerve had as well. Um, so what um, studies do we have performed and what results did we find? We have looked into the peripapillary um, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness distribution in the population. And um, you see here on the right side how this was performed in each of the sectors. We were looked into the different um, age decades and um, looked for the distribution within each sector um, in, in age. And then we also um, investigated the um, association with age, with um, um, spherical equivalent, intraocular pressure, axial length, and so on. And we found um, positive and uh, um, associations between the RNFL thickness and age, so age, is a factor that influences RNFL. RNFL gets thinner with age. 
We know that um, even uh, also the myopic eyes have thinner RNFL and uh, longer eyes have thinner RNFL as well. But this is still for the first time shown um, as data on a very large um, population. So what about the RNFL thickness and other ocular and cardiovascular factors and also lifestyle factors. We looked into that in another publication. And we also, uh, again, found that age was um, um, important for RNFL thickness. So the, the older the people, the thinner the RNFL. Um, the um, spherical equivalent, axial length, and self-reported glaucoma were also related to thinner um, RNFL. And as you can see on the right side, history of tinnitus was significantly associated in the multivariate um, analysis with RNFL thinning and alcohol intake. So these are a lot of factors that are investigated and um, each factor has to be taken um, with, with care into consideration. But still there are a few factors influencing the RNFL thickness um, in these population. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot of literature out there about the RNFL thickness between eyes. So we were wondering whether there is any difference between right and left eyes in peripapillary retinopharma layer. And, we have analyzed data of 6,139 patients. And what you can see here, we were looking into the um, angle between the highest RNFL yeah, in the superior area compared to the inferior area here. And then you can describe this difference of the maxima between the RNFL as an angle. Yeah, as you can see here with the angle alpha. And we found interesting results. There are differences between right and left eyes. So seen here as the red lines here and here, you can see that there are differences between the right eye uh, shown in blue and the left eye shown in orange in several regions of the peripapillary RNFL. So this was an interesting um, result of this study. So right and left eyes are not the same. We also were interested in um, the refraction of the patients. They were divided into different um, um, diopters. So as you can see on the left side, sorry, on the, yeah, on the left side, um, you can see the division of the patients into um, more than minus six diopters or more than plus three diopters. So very hyperopic and very myopic patients. And the myopic patients you can see as a red line and you see a myopic shift, excuse me, a temporal shift of the RNFL seen in red compared to more emetropic or hypertropic um, patients. This was the same for right and left eyes. And if you look at the axial length, it is um, comparable. So the longer eyes have more um, temporal shift of the RNFL compared to shorter eyes. So we also were interested in the choroidal thickness. Um, and with lots of work of manual measurements, some of um, our colleagues under the head of Professor um, Schuster, here seen on the right side, um, they have looked for the subfovial coral thickness measurements um, in a distance from 500 microns each. And they were interested whether there is any um, um, association with um, cardiovascular factors, age, and other parameters. And um, they looked for 2,550 eyes from more than 1,700 study participants. It was also published this year in clinical research in cardiology. And this is the um, distribution of the subfovial choroidal thickness on right eyes and subfovial 
coil thickness on left eyes that was quite comparable. There's also an association with age. So as you can see here on the left side, with um, increasing age, the choroidal thickness decreases. Between our men and women, there was a slight difference. Women had a slightly thicker choroidal thickness compared to men. In multivariate analysis, uh, we found that actually only age was associated with choroidal thickness. In univariate analysis, we found a lot of more factors, as you can see here in the table on the right side, that were all associated with choroidal thickness. So to, to summarize that choroidal thickness is associated with cardiac structure, and it can be explained by our aging organism. So age is a very um, important factor. And a very recent publication um, focused on epiretinal membranes. And you can see here on this table here that as expected um, in the older population, 70 to 80 years and also 60 to 70 years, the prevalence of epiretinal membranes are more often compared to younger patients and younger participants. And there are also some relationships. So age, again, is a very important factor. The older the patients, the more often they have epiretinal membranes. And the more myopic a patient is, the more often the um, epiretinal epi membrane can be found. And prior retinal laser treatment can be found as a, not a risk factor, but is also associated positively associated with the prevalence of epiretinal membranes. So these are all um, studies and we have more ongoing studies also on um, an NGO OCT at the moment. Um, so we are looking into the um, foveal um, NGO um, OCT and looking for the prevalence and changes and differences between um, the patients and between um, yeah, different kinds of um, diseases. And we are looking forward to show you more um, study results on this soon. And for this moment, I thank you for your attention, but I also want to thank Professor Schuster, who is the head of um, the ophthalmic part of the um, um, of the Gutenberg Health Study, who provided me with lots of these um, um, slides. So I'm very grateful for this. I want to say thank you. Stefan, I don't hear you. You can't hear me, so maybe... Oh, now I hear you. Yes. Now you hear me, so it's okay. <laughs> um, Probably the, the man at the audio was had a little nap, and this is understandable at the end of two days' hard work. Um, nevertheless, um, actually, there is a question, obviously, from a well-informed German colleague. His, um, um, his comment is, um, Esther, can you elude on the fact I read that uh, some COVID patients will be included in the Gutenberg Health Study. Is there any ophthalmic branch you are planning in order to reveal um, neurological changes? Because we always say the eye is the, the window to the brain. Um, wouldn't that be a good idea? Or is that even already thought about? I know it's probably too new to comment, but maybe you have a thought on that. Mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, um, the University Medical Center in Mainz is involved in this very large um, COVID-19 study group. So, um, but I'm not aware of, of this branch, but it might be actually, yes, you might be right that we are planning to um, perform uh, imaging on these patients, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure Professor Schuster would know, but I, I'm sorry, I, I would not, but it would be interesting to see, absolutely. Well, but we take it, take it as a, a good yeah. idea. I think uh, that sounds uh, appealing um, uh, as, a, as a very reasoned idea uh, uh, for that study. And there's one more uh, a question. Um, um, OCTA, you mentioned, is part of the study. What exactly are you looking at with OCTA? 
Well, at the moment, we are looking for um, the um, disease finding or the differentiation between glaucoma patients and normal patients. Um, unfortunately, the prevalence of glaucoma is very small in this population because they are quite young. So al although we included them uh, in 2007, but we had not the OCT NG at that time. And so, so the devices are quite changing over time. But now at the moment, so we, we are um, 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 analyzing the data of the optic nerve and also of the RNFL. And um, um, having the disease, yes or no, and looking for glaucoma, yes or no. And then we are performing the NGO CT to decide whether this might be a good option to um, differentiate glaucomatous eyes earlier, perhaps, or on other vascular structures, also correlated to other cardiovascular diseases we might see. And Professor Schuster is doing these um, study analysis at the moment. So I'm sure next year we will come out with some more information on that. And what do you look at at OCTA, like vessel density, or what are you do exactly you're looking at? Uh, some quantitative or qualitative data? What do you know what, what OCTA means? Well, I mean, the, the first is to, to look into the vessel density, exactly, mm -hmm. and to also to compare it to the RNFL thickness, to compare it to other structures of the ocular, and then compare it to the, to the vascular um, status of the patient. Vessel density is the first parameter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, actually, we are at the end of this uh, symposium. We had no dropouts <laughs> for two days, Wonderful. which is absolutely amazing. And uh, thank you again uh, for all the efforts you made to be here live, because we really learned in the two days that makes a difference and that keeps everyone um, interested and, and active. Um, you can stay with us.